once more took up his notebook and pencil and set down to work up the first ideas for this new figure, uncertain at first of its form, shape or material. This was the first large reclining figure Moore had ever done in metal. The man behind this groundbreaking film was John Reed, the son of Moore's great champion, the critic Herbert Reed. Over four decades, he made a series of influential documentaries about Moore. I liked him, and uh, I always felt, I wish my father had been more like him. And then one of his assistants said to me, you know, it's different when you come here. I said, how? He said, he treats you as though you're his son. Rather than interviewing more about this new work, Reed instead chose the role of unobtrusive onlooker in the artist's studio. As the plaster grew round the metal skeleton, a new work gradually came to life. Part of the originality of John Reed's first film is the emphasis on process. There is a real sense that you observe more at work in comparatively extended sequences and I don't think that had ever been done before. The joints must be strong enough to bear the weight that will rest on them. When it is finished, even an experienced sculptor would find it hard to discover where one section ends and the next begins. When you were filming, did he take an interest in what you were doing, where the camera was placed, how you were framing oh, his yes. work? He always wanted it filmed out of doors, in natural surroundings, with natural light. And the only trouble I ever had with a, with a rather conventional cameraman who wanted to light, light, light the sculptures, get rid of the shadows. Well, of course, the shadows give it the contours. And that was the only time I ever had an argument at all. And that was with the cameraman, not with him. Henry Moore's sculpture is at its best when seen in the light and setting in which it was born. In that film, John Reed and Henry Moore invent, in a way, the way in which an artist is presented. They invent the language of how you show an artist on television. And you know, there's a very real sense that all of us programme makers are the children of, of John Reed because of that film. John Reed not only caught the creation of a Moore sculpture, but also a moment of destruction. In 1967, he filmed a plaster cast breaking apart while Moore was away at lunch. The top section had cracked at its narrowest part. The plaster was torn, the armature had snapped. I've got a story there. I faked the sequence. You faked the sequence? Well, of course, I turned to the cameraman. I said, you get that? He said, no, I was changing the magazine. <laughs> then I remember the saying in the film business, if you've got a continuity problem, cut to the studio cat. And I knew he had a cat. So we got the cat, close up with the cat, banged the clapperboard, cat shoots off. Take a close up with some plaster dropping, cut it all together, everybody thinks they saw the accident happen. You'd be sacked for that today, John, you know that? <laughs> oh, yes, I know. You're a, you're a terror. To tell the truth, you have to cheat sometimes. By the time they'd got the first piece out, Moore came back from lunch. Surprisingly, he was calm, philosophical, and above all, practical. All of that response of Henry Moore's, that very good-natured response. Yes. You'd think he might have been absolutely oh, furious. Oh, so calm, wasn't he? It could be mended, it could be mended, he said. Don't worry. <laughs> this is what life is. Uh, sometimes you'll purposely destroy a thing to make something else out of it. Uh, art is not a, a process of just gradual perfection. So um, you take the rough with the smooth. Reed's films demystified Henry Moore's artistic process, showing that Moore used assistance at Perry Green. Mm. 
Moore would create maquettes, small models only as big as his hands. Assistants would then measure these models and create large-scale versions of them that Moore would finesse. One of these assistants would become the most important British sculptor after Moore, Anthony Caro, who became extremely close to his mentor. On the margins of these early Caro drawings, you can see some small sketches by Moore. It was Moore's way of instructing his young pupil. Don't worry, we'll straighten them out later. So the, all this work, this early work you've got out, this is all very much influenced by Moore. Oh, yes. It's, I mean, those eyes, it's just, you know, the Henry Moore type eyes, aren't they? And then that one where he would be explaining where the light was coming from here. I'm still trying to sort this thing out in my head. Henry is seeing it much richer. Would this be his drawing here? Oh, yes. I mean, he took a lot of time on me. It was very kind, very, very kind. I shall never forget it. Caro was Moore's assistant for two years in the early 50s, and he had a rather unusual first meeting with him. I found out where he lived, and I drove up to Much Haddam, and I knocked at the door, and Henry came to the door, and he said, who are you? And I said, well, my name's Tony Caro, and I'd like to work for you. And he said, well, you might have telephoned, but you better come in and have a cup of tea, which I thought was pretty nice of him, actually. And at the end, he said, well, there's no job now, but in six months' time, there might be. So six months to the day, I later, I telephoned. I said, do you remember me? He said, yes, I do. He said, start on Monday. It was, it was like a family, and, and I was adopted as one of the family. It was marvellous. Moore chose his assistants wisely. Many of them went on to become renowned sculptors in their own right. I think he felt it a bit of a mission to, to get talented artists uh, to work for him. I think he had, felt that uh, it would improve the general, um, general level of sculpture in this country as well that way. And uh, I think quite a few years he, he was trying to get some of the best students he could get hold of to do the work that weren't necessarily the best assistants in the world, but uh, I think he liked that challenge of, of a young, sort of bright assistants, yeah. The first thing I did was to wash the double knife edge outside the Houses of Parliament, except it wasn't outside the House of Parliament, it was outside his kitchen window. You've got this child, you know, 1920, working for you. You want to see if they're going to mess up your life. And I remember him coming out and saying, no, 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 wash from the top, not from the bottom. If you wash from the bottom, you get drips. Moore was an incredibly prolific artist producing countless drawings and around a thousand sculptures in his lifetime. And the scale of this production could never have happened without these assistants. The main part of the secret of getting us to do the work, so the kid, he, he wasn't sitting watching television, he'd be off doing other things. He'd be doing his drawing, his printing, his making more maquettes. Everybody's intention was to help keep him going. What were the wages like? Minimal. Two or three years before, I'd worked on the building sites, driving tractors and things, and I was earning, say, £15 a week then, and Henry was only paying about £14 a week to us. And the irony being that you knew that what, at the end of the day, some of those sculptures were selling for half a million upwards. So he was a bit tight? Well, he was a northerner, he was a Yorkshireman. <laughs> But it wasn't Moore or the assistants who kept Peregrine running like a well-oiled machine. It was a woman who shied away from the TV cameras, his wife, Irina. My father was an extrovert, my mother was an introvert. She was always in the background, rather like a cat, watching what was happening. Um, he could never say no. 
he, he was somebody who said yes to everything. Somebody would come along, can we do this? Can we make a film about this? Yes, yes, yes. She was the person who said no. And so, if, like the sun and the moon or the yes and the no, they, they work perfectly together. She presented the sort of scene, the environment, if you like, in which he could operate. He didn't have anything to worry about. He didn't have to worry about his clothes or his food or anything to do in the house. It was all organised by her. And that gave him the time to work. I think he was a natural workaholic anyway, and she encouraged it. Sometimes you don't feel like working. You know, if, you, if you've got a kind of a bit of a mood on you or you're down, Mrs Moore would see him out there into the workshop in the morning and sort of open the door and kind of push him in there, shut the door, <laughs> and get on with the carving. And he would pick up a mallet and he would... Tap. But he'd be holding the book and reading the book because he didn't feel like that. But he'd be banging on the desk, you know, to impress her. Once she'd hear that noise, she'd then go away in the house and get on with things. <laughs> While Moore produced his works at Perry Green, one patron devoted himself to making Moore a household name. Ladies and gentlemen, uh, I am very proud to be able to congratulate Harlow on behalf of all those who believe in civilization by their decision to make a work of art the center of their new town. Clark was the most influential art critic of the post-war years, a beacon of high culture. His relentless promotion of Moore led to the artist securing ever larger commissions. Clark was also a regular presenter on television and he featured more on his 1950s TV series, Is Art Necessary? I was allowed to go recently to the British Museum when it was closed to the public, when it was all dark, in the company of the greatest living sculptor, Henry Moore. It's too easy to get into the museum at night, does it? Doesn't it? Marvellous. Well, perhaps they might help us. They're open. They're open. Come Let's on. Let's go. I think Moore's relationship with Kenneth Clark is fascinating. You know, Clark was this extraordinarily prodigious character as director of the National Gallery when he was about 30. The establishment art person, if you like. Moore seems to... Um, enter into this sort of strange symbiotic relationship with Clark. You know, Clark very clearly sees Moore as the greatest artist he knows, and this great genius. But Moore also seems to feel a need for Clark's support. Some people close to Moore felt Clark had an undue influence on the sculptor's work, in the post-war period, pushing him towards grand public statements like the three standing figures in Battersea Park and away from his roots as a radical artist. When I saw the maquette of the three standing figures, I thought this was going to be something terrific. But the actual piece didn't work at all. It was very heavy, it was very stiff, the form was very dead. Being close to Henry, I was working for him and everything, I was rather ashamed and disturbed because I thought the piece was done. And I remember Henry, he was walking around and then he came over and he said, it's all right, I've seen Kay and he likes it. Kay being, of course, Kenneth Clark. Kay's approval meant more to more than everyone else. Despite the unease of some critics about the quality of Moore's more recent work, it wasn't a scepticism shared by much of the public. Moore the man was more popular even than Moore the artist, and the broadcasters soon cottoned on to this. In 1960, the week after Tony Hancock, Moore was the first artist to appear on Face to Face. For the first time, the viewing public were given a glimpse of Moore as the man next door. You live here in a very English village 
and uh, your work must be very different from anybody else who lives here. 